Hey everyone, welcome in to a, another daily editorial here on the KE Report. We're going to be focusing on some of that crazy volatility that we saw mostly in the precious metals over the last just couple trading days as we are chatting with Craig Hemke, founder and editor of tfmetalsreport.com. Craig, if we're looking at gold or silver, both have been doing well. Silver's actually been outperforming. And last Friday, man, oh man, they got off to a rip-roaring start and then reversed early on in the day on some very high volume, even when you look down at some of the equities as well. Silver made it almost up to that $30 an ounce level. Gold, man, that was continuing its uptrend as well. Craig, what's your takeaway from that action we saw at the tail end of last week, some of these almost extreme candles that we saw? Well, hi, guys. To me, this has been my sole focus for 15 years. And so as I've watched over the last 15 years, I see more, to me, overt perception management. And I, again, you can say, ah, oh, you're crazy. You're just, you know, connecting things on the wall like that. What was that John Nash movie, right, with Russell Crowe? You're just a crazy guy. But crude oil fell sharply on Friday as well. And, you know, 65% of the trading volume in crude oil now is robot, high-frequency trading. And the volatility has been dramatically depressed over the last six months. The price has been climbing, but it hasn't been volatile at all. And on Friday, counterintuitively, you would think, with everybody worried about a war in the Middle East starting, crude oil reversed about $2 as well. So some of that to me is perception management, silver getting ready to close above $28, $29 and have a breakout on the chart like gold had back on the 1st of March. Again, anybody can believe whatever they want. What's remarkable, frankly, is the volume. If you equate it with actual metal, silver, I think traded something like 227,000 contracts on Friday. That equates to I just ran these numbers, almost 1.2 billion ounces, you know, at 5,000 ounces per contract. The world is set to produce, according to the Silver Institute this year, about 830 million ounces. So you got, what, 1.4x total mine supply. You got about 4x the total vaulted silver on the COMEX. So it's huge volume. And I'll just, you know what, I just wrote about this today for Sprott Money in my weekly column. And so I'm just going to end this answer with this. Anybody can find this on Google. You know, there was a WikiLeaks unearthed and published about 10 years ago, a cable from December 10th, 1974, three weeks before gold futures started trading. And remember, Nixon had to close the gold window and the London gold pool failed because there wasn't enough gold around to keep the price at $35. So anyway, within this cable from the Department of the Treasury in the UK to the Department of State in the U.S., is a paragraph that says, to the dealer's expectations will be the formation of a sizable gold futures market. Each of the dealers expressed the belief that the futures market would be of significant proportion and physical trading would be minuscule by comparison. They also expressed the expectation that large volume futures dealing would create a highly volatile market. (laughs) In turn, volatile price movements would diminish the initial demand for physical holding and most likely negate long-term hoarding by U.S. citizens. Well, we sure had a volatile market on Friday, didn't we? 40 years later. So anyway, I'll just leave it at that. Well, thanks, Craig. Yeah, it was absolutely volatile on Friday. And maybe some of that is those expectations management, but some of it also could be key technical levels being hit. A lot of people were looking at 2,400 in gold as one of the technical targets, and it got up above that, I think like the 2440s, and then reversed down on the futures. Same thing with silver. That $30 line in the sand is a long-term resistance level, and it got up to 29.90 on the futures market, 10 cents below it, and then reversed down hard. But when you look at the last, let's say, month or two, overall, what you can say is that gold and silver have made some good progress, as have the mining stocks. And what did you think about silver and the mining stocks finally, Craig, starting to outperform gold on a percentage basis? Well, I lucked out in that regard. I I, I don't trade a whole lot anymore. Um, I have a tendency to get a little too emotional, and it tends to cloud my objectivity uh, and it impact what I provide for the you know the members of my site. But I did finally two weeks ago, 15 days ago, I should say, on Sunday night, the 31st of, was it Easter, I guess? Anyway, I thought, you know, this is probably enough. Gold kept going higher and silver was still 
twenty-four fifty or something like that. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to step in the casino and buy myself a silver call. I bought a twenty-six dollar May silver call, and I mean, price just immediately started going up. So I lucked out in that regard, and I've continued to luck out, kind of rolling forward with my strike prices. But I, I'm not going to try to say that that you know, oh boy, I knew I, you know, you sometimes you just the blind squirrel bumps into one. What you're seeing now, again, in silver is just kind of a rush to catch up. I will state, though, what's going on in copper is having a very positive impact for silver. And again, today, as we record this on Monday, you know, I have this, or the headlines over the weekend about the LME no longer accepting, or let's put this with U.S. and U.K. banning exports or imports of Russian copper, nickel, and aluminum, which affects the LME, which... That's a, I mean, I think 90 some odd percent of the LME's aluminum comes from Russia. 50 some odd comes from, of copper comes from Russia. So anyway, copper has been soaring off and on today. And, you know, the same algos pick up on that and have been helping silver. So there's a little, you know, kind of a little fundamental story in silver too, despite just this kind of rush of momentum to kind of catch up with what gold has done. Craig, how do you make sense of this environment here where we have energy moving higher, we have copper moving higher, and we also have precious metals moving higher? Are they moving all to different reasons or all four different reasons? Or is there something bigger going on here for the commodities complex broadly? Well, that's kind of the question everybody's trying to figure out, Corey. You know, I'm, you know as it relates like to gold. There's still articles every day. Gold's been rallying for six weeks. There's still articles every day on places like CNBC and Bloomberg. You know, analysts perplexed as to why gold's moving higher. You know, and and uh, you could say the thing, same thing about, I guess, in copper, you know, maybe the argument is, well, there's no landing stuff. You know, physical demand for copper is picking up that kind of... So you can make the case kind of for individual commodities, but definitely there's, as a sector versus tech... And equities, I've seen charts, you know, that uh, commodities are at, you know, decade lows of value against tech and versus, you know, the stock market. So, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's all taking place against the backdrop of a higher dollar, which usually, you know, a higher dollar index means commodities going down. So there's a, you know, there's a, a lot of cross currents. And again, I think that's why. These, you know, purported analysts are so flummoxed and flustered as to, you know, why they're moving, you know, so many different commodities are moving higher. At the end of the day, though, I, you know, I, I don't want to ascribe too much to what's happened in gold. You know, I got a lot of people out there saying, oh, the BRICS currency this, you know, and China premium that. Uh, and that in, okay, yeah, I, that definitely is having an impact, but I, that's not enough. To me, you can still just go all the way back to when gold broke out of its trading range. It was in a range for three and a half years. And the good thing about a long-term trading range is that everybody sees it. And so when gold broke out and closed above it on the weekly chart back on March the 1st, man, it quickly led to a big rush. And gold was on $2,200 a week later on March the 8th. Silver has eventually played catch-up, like I said, but it has yet to break out. That was avoided back on Friday. You know, when silver was $2,950, man, a weekly close there would have put it in the same boat as gold six weeks earlier. And what kind of rush into silver would we have had beginning today? So that's been, you know, stalled a little bit. But nonetheless, some of this is, you know, the old adage, price is going up just because it's going up. That's to me, is probably the majority of the picture. Well, Craig, just one more idea to float by you as it relates to the precious metals equities. You mentioned the strength in copper, and it has been strong. It's finally now getting up to the same point it was at a peak last year but it's still not at the all-time high it had in 2022. But when you look at the copper stocks, they've done great. The copper producers, especially, maybe not so much the juniors, but when you look at COPEX or ICOP or some of these copper ETFs, the copper stocks were doing good even when copper was channeling sideways. And now that it's broken up a little bit on the price chart, they've jumped even higher. Oil stocks, same pattern. When oil was channeling sideways in the mid-60s to mid-70s, they were still pretty strong and, and trending higher. And then now that oil popped into the 80s, They've, of course, popped up to new all-time highs as well, the big producers. Do you think we'll see the same kind of a trend where even if gold and silver prices pop up here and then channel sideways, could the mining stocks still have time to play catch-up like we saw with copper stocks or oil stocks? I'm sorry, Shad. Is that a rhetorical question? 
I don't know. It kind of answers itself. I'm just sitting here rattling off these wonderful statistics about copper miners and, and oil miners. And I'm thinking about the the gold and silver miners that just continue to just go nowhere, right? At least rally some. But remember, we were talking about Newmont a couple weeks ago and how even at $40, it's the same price that it, it was 20 years ago. I kind of still sticking with my company line, which is there's money to be made in the mining shares. There's money to be invested in the mining sector. But man, you got to do your homework. I mean, it's got to be a, a company that really watches the bottom line, a company that has good prospects to continually grow what they're putting out every quarter, a company that that has high, reasonably high grades, you know, so that the cost of getting it out of the ground and and uh, and taking it from there remains low. The sector as a whole, though, Shad, man, I'm still not. not it just drives me crazy because, again, like you mentioned, look at copper's going up and Freeport McMoran's doing great, that sort of thing. But you look at some of the big miners of gold and they just continue to drive us crazy. And you're not wrong at that one, Craig. We're, I think, all a bit disappointed still at the lack of momentum that some of these stocks have had, but maybe they can build on that last month and a half of trading. However, it seems like we've seen a little bit of a slowdown in momentum recently. Just quickly circling to U.S. equity markets, we have seen a bit more weakness to start this second quarter. Maybe some of that is the money that's rotating more into the commodities here because there has been a big rotation theme what are you watching in terms of the broad averages and what is driving those when you do consider higher interest rates, higher dollar, and now less Fed cuts being priced in? Yeah, let's watch the S&P, Corey. You know, every time I'm on Twitter all every day because I got to sit there. It's the best source for, you know, live news. You know, something happens with Israel and Iran tonight, like what people are expecting. You're going to know about it first on Twitter. So on Twitter, there have been, I don't know, you know, I don't even know how many, mini, you know, many tops, even in the last, since the first of the year in the S&P. Okay, look at that red candle. That means it's pulled back. Oh, this is the mother of all bear markets is starting. And then it just recovers and goes back higher. You can look at the chart, though, now. And even on the very short-term moving averages, like a 20-day moving average, the S&P has rolled over. Now, there's an old gap in the chart there, right around 5,000 on the S&P. And I'd encourage anybody that, has a significant exposure to equities in general to watch that gap, pull up a chart, just, you know, go to any charting website, pull up a chart and, you know, look for yourself. You know, if it starts rolling over under 5,000 and falling more sharply, yeah, we may have a top and we may have a more significant pullback on our doorstep. So that's what I'd want everybody to watch in the S&P. You know, on the flip side of that, you know, and to Shad's question earlier about silver, Comex Silver, the May contract, today, Monday, just closed. It's the front month. It just closed at its highest daily close since Silver Squeeze Day, Feb Monday, February 1st of 2021. The short-term chart continues to trend higher. And if you really want to, if you're an aggressive trader, you want to ride that wave. About as short of a moving average you can look at is a five-day moving average. And Silver has ridden that five-day used it as support multiple times in the last week or so. It's ridden it for, oh, really, since late, late March uh, when things really took off. It's now still riding it. And so for anybody that's aggressively trading silver, keep an eye on that, too, because you pull down, eventually it'll pull down, close below that five-day, and that'll be a sign now that you're flagging and consolidating. But for now, the trend remains higher. So there's just a couple things to watch not only in silver, but then in equities in general. And we'll see where we go from there. Well, and Craig, just as we look forward, you always are pretty good at keeping tabs on the economic data. I think some of the equity weakness is probably just people starting to price in less and less cuts this year and that maybe they got too aggressive. But is there any other economic news on your radar that you think people should keep tabs on? Well, we're getting into the uh, back half of the month. And so we get some of the you know back half of the month data like durable goods. And eventually we'll get into the PCE, the Fed's favorite inflation indicator, as I always call it. That's about two weeks away. Uh, we're also going to be battling the usual monthly stuff in COMEX trading. May silver is the front month now in silver. And that'll be going off the board in about two weeks and into delivery. We've got options pricing coming up in 10 or 12 days as well. So you've got all that stuff we've got to fight. 
And then, again, as we have to watch every single month, Powell indicated at the March FOMC that he's watching the unemployment rate very, very closely. It actually downticked with the last jobs report two weeks ago from 3.9% to 3.8%. But he's made it very clear in multiple public appearances that he's not going to, I mean, if he sees something north of four, he'll cut 25 basis points despite the inf- where whatever in- inflation is doing. So uh, watch the, for the jolts data later this month then in the first week of May, and then we'll, we'll wait for that next May jobs report or the April jobs report the first Friday of May too. All right, Greg. Always great chatting with you. Hey, we are talking about higher metals prices, and that is a good thing for the sector, but for the precious metals investors still just waiting for those stocks to really get that torque to the upside. They have rebounded, but they definitely need to follow through for longer than just about a month to a month and a half here. Something that I'm sure we'll keep on talking about. Craig, great chatting with you. Thanks for taking time early on in the week. We'll chat again next week. Have a great rest of your week. Okay, guys, all the best.